everybody. Um, welcome to our uh, town hall discussion. Um, I just want to say off the bat that this project was made possible with support from the California Humanities, a nonprofit partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, and you can visit www.calhum.org for more information. Um, I also wanted to just do um, a really brief land acknowledgement for not just the Bay Area, but also for where the Topaz site is in Utah. So here we are on uh, Ramatush, Ohlone, um, Mawikma, Ohlone, and Ohlone land. And in uh, the Topaz site is located on Ute, Paiute, and Goshute ancestral lands. And we just want to acknowledge that before we start. Um, so today, the first half of our town hall, we're going to be talking with Mary Farrell, archaeologist, and Nancy Ukai, everything else, I don't know, and yeah, 50 <laughs> objects person. Uh, and also, it's going to be moderated by Patrick here, uh, Hashi. And um, what, what we're going to start with right now is I'm going to show a, about a seven minute video by Brandon Shimoda, who is a poet, author, sorry, uh, that's okay. A poet and author, and he does a little bit of reflection on the importance of stone. So we're going to start with that, and then we're going to go to the discussion here with the three of three of them. So. My name is Brandon Shimoda. I'm a Yonsei poet and a descendant of Japanese immigrants and Japanese Americans who were incarcerated in Fort Missoula, Poston, and Hart Mountain. I'm gonna share some thoughts about the significance of stones in Japanese tradition to the Issei and Topaz, to the spirit of James Hatsuaki Wakasa, and to us. I'm going to start with a story. It comes to us from Buddhist mythology. There is a place children go when they die called Sai no Kawada, the dry bed of the river of souls. When children find themselves abandoned, bewildered, yet with a mysterious purpose in the dry bed, they begin to gather stones which they build into towers. It is only after building towers of stones that the children are able to achieve their afterlife. But the children are not alone. With them in the dry bed of the river of souls are demons who knock over the towers, scatter the stones, and prevent the children from achieving their afterlife. The children, however, are undeterred, but keep gathering stones, keep building towers, keep striving to cross the threshold out of the underworld and into the afterlife. I'm telling this story because we, survivors and descendants of incarceration, are the children. The stones are the past communicating with us in the present. The towers are the work we are doing to reimagine and redeem our history. The demons are whatever and whomever prevents us from healing. Because the dry bed of the river of souls is our life. When the Issei in Topaz found a 1,000 pound stone and erected it for James Hatsuaki Wakasa, they transformed the stone into a site of consolation, offering to Wakasa and his spirit a place to rest. In Shinto, stones are vessels, homes, sanctuaries for kami, which are spirits inseparable from nature. The Issei, therefore, were making Wakasa's spirit and his memory inseparable from nature, simultaneously located in place and surrounding us while imbuing the stone with the perspective of eternity, which is, after all, where it came from, outer space, the ancient lake, eternity. The stone would outlast the memory of those who were there and those who came after and would see topaz beyond its end. When the government ordered the stone be destroyed, and when the Issei, undeterred, buried it, the stone transmigrated into the realm of collective imagination. 
It was neither missing nor lost nor hiding. It was when it was found by Jeff Burton and Mary Farrell using a map discovered by Nancy Ukai exactly where it was last touched. This is a sign from your ancestors, Mary said in a conversation with Nancy. This is their voice, Nancy said of the Issei. I visited the stone earlier this year on May 29th at 11.09 in the morning. It had been sitting in the courtyard of the Topaz Museum on a strip of gravel between the tar paper barracks and a fence, on a piece of carpet draped over a wooden pallet beneath a corrugated shed open on the bottom, exposed to the elements, in other words, incarcerated for 308 days. That was over 100 days ago. After seeing the stone, I texted Nancy that it seemed embarrassed and very solemn in its embarrassment. But then I thought, no, it was not embarrassed. It was humiliated. The stone's injury and its shame cut much deeper than being merely embarrassed because the stone resting or attempting to rest was and is being made to endure something beyond its control. According to the Sakuteki, the Heian period text on the subject of gardening, stones have personalities, they have opinions, they think, they feel, and they have ways of communicating their thoughts and feelings. When I saw the stone, I wondered what it was thinking and feeling. I wondered if anyone had asked its opinion. People, meanwhile, both in and outside of our community, have offered in morbidly obtuse and insensitive terms their own opinions. Many have suggested, for example, that we need to move on. When the stone was removed, our community was deprived of the opportunity to heal. It could have been a ceremonial unearthing, motivated by the worshipful intention of aiding the stone and the spirit it was made to console through the transition from its grave into the light of the 21st century. Because without healing, there is no legitimate or enduring way to move on. That is not how trauma works, nor is that the purpose or maybe the opinion of a stone that was meant to mark our relationship to it. As Patrick Hayashi has said, I'm not ready to move on. There's still a lot of pain that's surfacing. And frankly, I just want to be alone with the pain for a while. I imagine the Issei felt the same because the pain that is surfacing was theirs for which the stone was a form of healing. When I told Emiko Omori about what I read in the Sakuteki that stones have opinions and that maybe to resolve the question of what should be done with the stone, would be to ask the stone what it wants. She said, the stone has done its job. And then revising her thoughts slightly said, the stone is doing its job. The memorial is not only the stone, but what happens because of it. It is imperative to consider where it was, by which I mean all the way back through geological time, where it is now, and to imagine and contribute to where it might go next but it is also imperative to consider what is happening because of its existence. Maybe it is not only that we, with our indivisible and indomitable energy and vigilance are protecting the stone, but that the stone is protecting us. Some powerful force emanates from the stone, Emiko said, and we are awash in its force.
I love stones. That stones were the main material tool for millennia, forever. And so stones, stones really speak to me as far as what you know people did with them. But I never ever thought about them talking to us. That I mean, if you, it, I've worked with some tribal people recently who have, who have expressed this very similar feeling that the stones belong to the land. We, we do not own the land, the land owns us. We belong to the land. We take care of it and the stones are a part of that. And so I just, I felt so moved and I was so, I felt uh, positive when he said that stone could help us. Um, I would just like to thank Brandon for giving words to feelings that I've had but haven't been able to articulate. And I think that my own feelings have probably been a little more prosaic and closer in history than yours, Mary, because when I first thought about the stone being removed as it was, I thought the last people to touch that stone were the Issei, and their hands pushed it into the hole where it was then buried and uncovered for 77 years, at least until we rediscovered it. And, um, and it just has made me think, what was the purpose of it being found by us now? And I think part of its legacy is that it's brought all of us together here. And the legacy is still unfolding. And I think Brandon touched upon that, but all of us here are connected by that stone because we're interested enough to think about it and be here together. And some of our relatives were probably at that funeral and maybe told us about James Locasa. When I was seven, uh, my mother told me the story of Mr. Locasa and his murder. And I, I had no idea why why she told me that story. Um, and it was the only story about Topaz that she told me. And like a lot of Japanese American families, uh, my family was very quiet and rare, rarely spoke about the camps. And when they did speak about the camps, they only talked about the good parts. Much later, my mother died when, when I was 11. Uh, she had a rheumatic heart and Topaz wore her out. And my father, who was, had always been very quiet, became even more quiet. And so um, I put that story out, away, out of my mind as something that had happened a long time ago. Then when I got older, I realized that my mother was saying, be careful because you, you are going to grow up in a society filled with racism and I'm not going to be around, uh, but please be careful and take care of yourself. So when, when I heard about the discovery of the stone, it, it meant a lot to me. And then when I heard about it's desecration. I was really, really angry. And um, I had a, a really, really wonderful conversation with Patricia Wakita. And she said, you shouldn't use the word desecration. And I said, for me, the stone is sacred because of its connection with my mother. And for me, desecration fits. But I think that everyone has to make their own decision about that. Um, the interesting thing is that I'm no longer angry about the treatment of the stone. And I've, and I've been wondering about that. And I think the reason for that is because Look what's happened. 
we've come together. You know, I've made friends with people. And our community is getting stronger because of it. There's a Stanford archaeologist named Ian Hodder who says that when an artifact is unearthed, it can bring a community together or it could tear it apart. I think Mr. Wakasa's monument has done both. I think it's uh, revealed deep divisions within our community, but it's also brought people together in new and wonderful ways. And I think that as we work through this together as a community, our community is get, going to get stronger. I'm especially uh, moved by the involvement of Beyonce in this discussion. And I think um, Brandon's wonderful commentary is just one example of all the wonderful things that are going to emerge. Um, the monument was discovered by a series of lucky accidents. And uh, I'd like to ask Nancy if you could tell us the beginning of this and then Mary. Um, I was at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. and doing research on the killing of James Hatsuaki Bokasa and looking through various um, government record groups and came across this map, which was not in the 210 um, or relocation authority files, but I knew that this hand-drawn map, which was made 20 hours after Mr. Wakasa was shot through the heart and the spine and died on his back, that it was important because the, the measurement from the guard tower to the death spot was in inches. Um, and at the time, it was 2015, I was doing this research for the Topaz Museum, which hadn't opened yet. Um, and there was a need to expand upon the research that had been done about James Wakasa. So it sat in my files until actually 2020. And um, I have this website I'm working on with David Izu and a team of people called 50 Objects. And we look at artifacts and physical things as ways to tell stories about the World War II incarceration. So this was during Black Lives Matter it was after the murder of George Floyd, and Confederate monuments were being pulled down every day. There were massive protests in the street, as you all remember, it's during COVID. And I thought, well, the Wakasa monument is something that um, was assumed to have been destroyed, but it existed at one point in history, and so that counts. And in fact, it was buried, its history was erased, and um, I had assumed it was demolished because government documents said, we're looking at photographs and there is no more debris on the ground. So I, not knowing what it looked like, um, knowing that cement and native stones were supposed to be what made it up. And in fact, for our webpage, because we had no drawing, there were photographs which were referred to by the military, but haven't been able to find them. Um, David Izu, our photographer, went to um, Home Depot bought a bag of cement, dumped it on the piece of photographic paper, and that symbolized the demolished monument that been pulverized into dust. So, um, and then I put the map into the story, although it was kind of a problem, it was a little problematic because uh, Issei, um, George Shimamoto, and two other Issei, the day after, um, went to the guard tower and they had a hundred yard. Um, measuring tape, the WRA drove them there to get the, make this map, and they came up with a measurement of 946 feet and three inches, which is 315 yards and three inches. The military and the court martial said there was, it was 250 yards between guard and the death spot. The WRA said about 300 yards. So this um, map said 350 Inches, but you know, it's a little bit in the weeds for your average reader of a blog post. Thought, well, I'll put the map in, and um, you know, 
it's there. Never, ever thought that two archaeologists who I knew about by reputation but had never met would decide during forest fires and COVID, and one of them had just finished chemo treatment, would get in their car, drive to Utah, several hundred miles away, and then send me an email one week later, subject line, found the Wakasa monument. What does that mean? Okay, Mary, your turn. <laughs> I guess I had heard about Mr. Wakasa maybe maybe 30 years ago when we were working on confinement and ethnicity. And I thought, oh, this is this is a tragic story. This is really sad. He was one of the 120,000 innocent victims who were incarcerated because of racism. But I didn't, I think you hear a big number like that and it doesn't grab you as much as as what Nancy's research did when, you know, she's talking about him walking a dog. That's a person. Um, talking about a little boy that talked to him that day. That's, and, and plus, when, the, when I first heard about him, I heard he was an elderly man. Well, now that I'm older than he was, I'm thinking, well, he, he had a lot of good years left in him. And so to, to me, his story got more the more I knew about him, the more I was touched by him, and the more I, I felt it was an important story. As Nancy said, when she published the, her 50 Objects story, it was during the summer, the summer Black Lives Matter, and I thought, oh, here's another case of a, of a person in authority killing a person who's innocent, and it just, it really moved us. And, it was Jeff's idea that we should go look for, see if we could find. Archaeologists, we get excited if we find a nail or a little, <laughs> a little tiny piece of concrete or something. So we didn't, we didn't know what we would find, but we thought, oh, we'll find something, a change in the soil. There'll be, there'll be some little thing there that indicated where, what, what was there. So uh, we were, we were kind of shocked to see that. There was this very rock, we didn't even know how big it was, but it, it looked like a significant rock. It was a rock that you do not find in that lake bed. Uh, it was, it looked like a, it looked like a memorial stone that we might have seen at Manzan where Jeff works or at one of the other camps where people have erected stones to memorialize something. So. So we thought it was a story that the Japanese American community needed to hear, to hear how these Issei friends of Mr. Wakasa had defied the, the military and the WRA. And, you know, they, they built this monument when they were told not to. They demolished it, but not really. Um, and they, they, they buried it, and I guess the part that was exciting to us as archaeologists is, could we tell how they buried it, how it was originally constructed? Just, you know, like, if we, if the community wanted it to be excavated, if they wanted it to be looked at that way, or maybe not. I mean, when we wrote the article, we had several suggestions, maybe, that we thought would maybe could be considered as ways to honor Mr. Wilcoxa and his memorial stone. And that's what we put out there. In a conversation that uh, Nancy had with uh, Mary, Mary referred to the landscape gardeners who erected the monument as badass Issei. Now Issei have never ever been referred to as badass, but the uh, power and beauty of the monument is that it is changing and deepening the narrative of Topaz and all the camps. The dominant narrative now has been that 
the camps were unconstitutional and unjust, but people were treated humanely. And um, for the most part, Japanese Americans accepted the confinement passively. This changes the narrative in fundamentally important ways. The shot that killed Mr. Wakasa was not the only shot fired at Topaz. It was the eighth shot fired. And a month later, another shot was fired at a couple walking close to the fence. And it was a, a Japanese American committee that agreed with the camp authorities that the monument should be destroyed. And that committee was probably composed of uh, Nisei. And for the Issei to defy that committee shows some of the intergenerational uh, tensions that arose. So this story is changing everything, our entire understanding. Um, how does it feel to, to make this discovery and, and change our sense of our own history? I think I'm one link in a very long chain and I won't say a link, link but, <laughs> but a link. And um, I'm so grateful, or maybe I should say a web of connections, because we're going bigger and stronger. And I was actually invited to um, speak at an Association of African American Museum conference about museum staff who were having to handle objects of racial violence and the trauma and emotional um, difficulty that curators and people go through. And they invited me as not a museum professional, but as someone whose museum mistreated a spiritual artifact. And um, it was really interesting to speak to a standing room only crowd of people who were not Japanese American, but who were nodding their heads and saying, yes, communities need to be consulted. The, center, the Japanese American voice needs to be centered. And yes, you know, how did you get organized as a committee? People were interested in practical things. Um, what is the role of the National Park Service? And what does justice look like to you? Um, amazing conversations were begun and people said, you know, this is your history. You have to tell your history. And I said, well, we're trying to, you know, the Wakasa committee started and we're trying to sit at the table. We asked for mediation. We tried to, um, ask for things like releasing the videos so that Japanese Americans can view our own history and also um, gain the scientific baseline information that's available in that video for a re-excavation to take place and so on and so <coughs> forth. And people came up and said, you should write a curriculum and I'd like to help. Or, you know, and so at any rate, it really widened my sense of our story being a case study and being part of American history. It's not just our small community but really part of a larger web, a larger wave, a larger narrative that I think we need to think not of just as the topaz stone and the Wakasa stone, and the specificity is very important, but it's also emblematic of all the violence that was taking place in the camps and um, should be thought of it as an American civil rights as well as an object, as well as a spiritual artifact. Um, and as an object of resistance, because as Mary alluded to, what you say, well, the whole camp wanted to hold the funeral right where Wakasa died, right next to the fence. Um, and the blood was still in the ground. And I'm sure that the uh, camp authorities thought there's gonna be a riot because the day after he was killed, which was on Sunday night, Monday and Tuesday, the army came out with tear gas, uh, machine guns to quell a riot that they expected. And then by the third day, they took them down. But people were very upset. Um, there were work stoppages. And those are the kinds of things you don't really hear about. Then people wanted to build a memorial, but that was denied. 
there were all kinds of um, meetings that went on to two and three in the morning, and these notes are in the National Archives where people are talking, you know, we're, we're American citizens or we're citizen, we're Japanese who have been denied the ability to become citizens. What are our rights? Does the Constitution mean anything? People were having legal discussions. It's, it's really quite fascinating. But I think, as um, Patrick said, it's also made me think about this specific case, the censorship that took place. Nothing in the Topaz Times was written about the monument. Nothing was written about the eight, nine shots taken from the guard tower at people. And this is the military records which came in the court martial. And I think that the military put them in to prove, quote unquote, that people were trying to escape because the military record would say, guard tower seven shot at two Japs trying to escape. And of course that was a narrative for James Wakasa, although he died parallel to the fence on his back with a bullet piercing his heart. And so he was facing the guard tower. Then the other um, falsehood is, oh, he didn't hear the gunshot because he was deaf. Well, he wasn't deaf because there's a lot in the records about how he talked to people on Den Show, their interviews with people who knew him. Um, and if you actually go there, and we'll have a slide to share later, the distance is three football fields put end to end very far away. When you're out there, you can't hear anything. So this idea that this guard shouted halt four times and therefore had to shoot Wakasa and he didn't stop going through the fence is a falsehood. So it makes me rethink, what are we reading in the Topaz Times? No, um, what are we thinking about the fact that um, people were living in this sense of secrecy, terror, um, these acts of violence happening, but not being reported. Um, I think it would make you question your sanity. Everyone, you're living in a prison. Uh, I wanted to ask Mary, how does it feel to have discovered the most important artifact, not only at Topaz, but in any of the confinement sites? Holy cow. <laughs> I don't, you know, Jeff and I were talking about this this morning. Anybody could have found it. Um, it's just that archaeologists always have hope that they're going to find something. And so what isn't, it's not so impressive that we found it. It's impressive that the Issei left it there for us to find. And I also think it's really impressive that the Wakasa Memorial Committee is asserting their right to, I don't want to say control, but to learn from, to be part of, to participate in the decisions about this rock, because that's, a, I think that archeologists have learned a lot about descendant communities and the importance of involving them in decisions about their heritage. It's, this is an important story for all of our country, but it's Japanese American heritage. So I think it's really cool that Japanese Americans are are so badass. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I posted something on Facebook, and my friend Dale Minami uh, asked me, "Who owns the rock? Who owns the monument?" And that just made me start thinking about. The concept of ownership and how one decides that. I mean, there would be a narrow legal response, but there also has to be a, a cultural, uh, political, and spiritual answer as well. Did you want to go again? Um, because we're going to continue for an hour, just in what time is. Slipping by because there's so much to say. I'm going to just show some slides of a WRA photo taken at Topaz that Kimiko Ma found the other day. And when I saw this, I thought, oh my gosh, is that the Wakasa Monument? It's about five feet tall and it's very large. And um, I'm going to keep panning out. October 17th, 1942. You can see a nurse there and a large crowd of people. So it turns out this stone monument was built 
and was used to dedicate the new hospital at Topaz. The caption said, a young doctor of Japanese ancestry describes the meaning of the inscribed stone at the dedication of the new hospital at the Topaz Relocation Center, Tom Parker. The Topaz Times several days later said, despite a last minute notice, this section did a remarkable job in making the general arrangements for the hospital dedication ceremonies which were held last Sunday afternoon. A large crowd was present at the first center-wide assembly. The unveiling of the monumental stone by Mrs. Ed Kito, head nurse, was a feature of the program. This rock, weighing close to four tons, was brought in by members of this department about a week ago from the hills, some 10 miles west of Topaz. And we know that there's a quarry. I learned in Delta last week, it's called Smelter's Mole from Dean Draper, a city commissioner. Um, it made me think this picture of the funeral, which would occur six months later for James Lacasa, the first center-wide um, concentration camp-wide funeral, April 19th. But back at the dedication, there's another photograph, and Tom Parker writes, an evacuee resident who is a Christian minister opens the hospital dedication with a moving prayer. And you can see people with their heads bowed. So Koza Baba, who was um, an Issei from San Francisco, he had a laundry. Eight days before the hospital dedication, Mr. Baba passed away. He had only been in Topaz for 10 days. So was the opening dedication also a remembrance for Mr. Baba, who had been born in Japan in 1882? The minister's dedication was described by WRA photograph Tom Parker as moving a prayer. Now, in 1939, this photograph was taken at UC Berkeley. And I just wanted, thought it would be interesting to share with you because we're wondering how did those Issei landscapers move those giant stones? So in 1939, after the close of the Golden Gate International Exposition, Kaneji Domoto of the Nomoto family, who were major horticulturalists and nursery men, raised money to transport rocks from the Japanese Pavilion Garden in San Francisco to UC Berkeley's Botanical Garden. And you can still see those stones there now, where he incorporated them into the design for the San Simeon Garden Pool. Mary, when you look at these, do you think about how the Issei might have um, moved the stone, that 1,000 pound Wakasa monument? Have you all seen Japanese gardeners do this? It's amazing. It's so impressive to watch because with three poles and pulleys, and I don't remember what they taught us in sixth grade, but if you wrap it around enough pulleys, you, you can move thousand pound rocks with just a person. And uh, it's a, it seems primitive, but it's so sophisticated and wonderful. So uh, um, yes, this is what uh, we've seen Japanese gardeners do this. It's, it's magnificent, um, it's powerful, and it's also gentle at the same time. Because I can't remember if Brandon talked about it, Gardeners see a face in the rock, and they they set it in such a way that the face is is situated comfortably and properly, so it can see well. And so yeah, I can I can imagine that this would have been how they did it. You, um, the topaz is also some pretty big rocks, not as big as the one at the hospital or the one at um, for Mr. Wakasa, but they have a. Uh, pretty big rocks in other places, like at the at the Buddhist church, that they may have, some of them they may have set with a system like this. You know, Brandon was saying that the rock is giving us gifts. And one gift I got tonight was I got to see the place I was born. I was born in that hospital. And that immediately made me think of my friend Dale Shimazaki's mother, who was 15 at the time, and she volunteered 
to work in the hospital. And at the time, TB was known as the white plague um, and because it was often fatal. And one evening she was working alone and, and a TB patient needed a shot of uh, morphine. And she described how she had to uh, liquefy the morphine in a spoon over a Bunsen burner and um, then fill up the syringe. And they reused their syringes so the needles weren't very sharp. And it took her three jabs to, to insert it. And uh, the man who she uh, gave the shot to finally said, Jozu, Jozu Arigato. And that captured it all because even it, it, this man who knew he was dying was able to be gracious to this young girl who was trying her best. And in that hospital, next to the hospital part, the medical part, was the morgue where this man was placed. And on the other end was the TB ward where TB patients uh, were held until most of them died. Are there questions or comments? So I think we will move into um, a discussion of of uh, how the rock has been, how the monument has been handled, its current status, and what the uh, Wakasa Memorial Committee is uh, asking for. Uh, but before we do, I uh, full disclosure. Uh, I am not a member of the Wakasa Memorial Committee. Um, as Groucho Marx said, I would never belong to an organization that would have me as a member. And uh, full disclosure part two is that the president and founder of the Topaz Museum, Jane Beckwith, Jane Beckwith and I worked together for several years where we gave uh, summer workshops to Utah teachers on Topaz. And the first time I went to Delta, Jane took me to the uh, Great Basin Museum in Delta. And uh, she showed me this glass case where she was displaying artifacts that she had picked up at Topaz, rusty nails and the like. And then over the years, I watched with great admiration of how she took that glass case and turned it into a, a museum. Um, Jane and I worked very well together. Before the first, our first workshop, she asked me if uh, I would like to know about the t uh, students or the participants. And I said, sure. And she said, 25 teachers have signed up at least 24 of whom are Mormon. And I said, what does that mean? And she said, it means that they have a keen interest in local history, that uh, they will ask very good questions and they will be unfailingly polite and respectful. I said, well, they sound perfect. So I'll give them a special welcome. So I began the program by saying that I wanted to share exciting archeological news. I said that morning, a team of BYU religious anthropologists had found strong uh, archeological evidence corroborated by 
major biblical verses that Jesus loves miso. Um, when, when the teachers heard this, the people in the front row got up, wadded up their notepads, and started throwing paper balls at me. And then we relaxed and we had a wonderful, wonderful open discussion. And that's the kind of discussion I hope we have today uh, where everyone uh, gets to have their say and we all listen with an open heart and an open mind. So are there questions? I think we're probably ready to take our five to 10 minute break. Oh yes. Let's get back at six. I imagine a pool of blood, Mr. Wakasa's blood. I saw them around that pool as the um, you know, blood cools and the vapors rise. These would rise with the blood vapors and capturing his spirit. I gather he was a real adventurer and was curious about lots of things. And I hope that spirit of, you know, being an adventurer and wanting to meet new people and see new places, uh, experience new societies, maybe that's captured here too. I've always been struck by him having a a picture of Abraham Lincoln with him. And I know that he went to a, a really progressive university. And I, I wonder if he was introduced to Lincoln at that university. It's funny, I, I, you know, I always call him Mr. Wakasa. I don't know why. Maybe because I was introduced to him that way. My mother had told me about the story. It, it was the only story that my mother told me about Topaz. You know, we didn't talk much about Topaz. We're a lot like a lot of Japanese American families. And she died when I was 11, so I didn't have a lot of chance to talk to her. And we weren't a talkative family. And my father, who thought that Topaz had killed my mother, because she had a rheumatic heart and Topaz wore her out and he didn't say anything about it either. But I think uh, she was preparing me for a life, a life in a society filled with racism. But that kind of preparation I think is done through stories generally. I think we, we try to prepare our children to help them survive in a tough society at night. That's what my mother was doing for me.
when I scrape the pastel on it, it looks like it's random, but it's not. I try to uh, concentrate it in a certain area, concentrate the red in an area and the white in another area. Most of it disappears, and I know it's going to disappear, but some of it re uh, remains, uh, which is nice, and some of it uh, creates a different texture within the painting. I don't know quite how it acts, but it's kind of interesting. Museums intimidated me because I didn't feel I belonged there. Hardly ever went to museums as a kid or even as, as an ad adult. I thought that there are rules or conventions about whether you go left or right or straight ahead, and I didn't know any of them, so never felt comfortable in it. But in this one, first of all, it was mainly Japanese in the exhibit, uh, visiting the exhibit, and mainly Nisei. And so I go in, and the first painting I saw was a, a still life. I don't know who it was by. It was, uh, I think, a remembered scene of the Sacramento Del Delta. It was a riverscape. And then the second painting was uh, by, I don't know who it was, but it was uh, a still life, a bo uh, vase of flowers. And when I looked at them, I started to choke up. I don't know why, because so I didn't care about art. And, and then I went on and I just started to get more and more choked up and then I turned a corner and there was uh, Obata's painting of uh, Mr. Wakasa falling over. I just actually just started to sob. Everyone, all the Nisei around me were crying too. And so that, that got got me interested in art and I learned as much as I could about Obata and you know I started taking brush painting lessons from his uh, main student Shirley Renter Miller. I thought that brush painting ability was genetically encoded in me and all I had to do was clear my mind and let the paint flow and out it would come. And that turned out not to be correct. And, and, but I stuck with it for about a year. And, uh, and Shirley was a great teacher. And she was the one who um, gave me uh, Obata's paintbrush that he had made in Tokyo for him and his Furoshiki and his inkstone and and his ink st stick half used i understand that he used to have his wife grind his inks for him and um and um surely said he was pretty crafty that way and i I've, I've just never had the uh i just never felt that i was uh, that I had the right to use his brush, so I'm not good enough. And so I'm going to give this to his.
Peskin, um, along with Supervisors Connie Chan, Supervisors Dean Preston, and pr uh, President of the Board, Shaman Wal Walton, have uh, authored a resolution encouraging uh, Rec and Park to create interpretive signage. And this is something that um, is something that we would have hoped that Recreation and Park would have done on their own, but they did not. Um, and so we are hoping that you would be willing to support it. I have brought copies of the resolution that will be discussed next Tuesday and, and some sample letters that if you can just um, either take one or just email out to the th four supervisors and then to the Board of Supervisors clerk, uh, urging your support for this interpretive panel, it would be greatly appreciated. And at the same time, the San Francisco Historic Preservation Commission will be sponsoring its own resolution um, urging Recreation and Park to do this. So we really don't have authority uh, to make this happen, but we're hoping with everybody's uh, letters of support that they will listen to us. So thank you. And thank you for allowing me to listen in on this discussion as well. My parents and grandparents were all incarcerated at Topaz. So let me give it before Dan gets interviewed. <laughs> uh oh, yeah, I think you are it. Okay, so now we're going to, um, before we get to the Q&A portion, we're going to show a very uh, short video that just kind of explains the chronology of what happened uh, since the stone was found. And then we're going to come back. And that's when you all have an opportunity to ask your questions. We do have a few questions from our virtual audience. Anyone at home, please just type them into the chat and we will make sure that we ask them. So we're going to just play a really short video right now. And then we'll be back with with Patrick, so I'll let you hold this. I'll put that there. Put that there.
Now would be a good time for comments and questions. I have a question about archaeology that I'd like to ask Mary, uh, because I'm really interested in what the next steps should be for a proper archaeological excavation. And, and I'd like you, since you're here, <laughs> to take advantage of your wonderful experience at Manzanar. What could, what what could you tell us? I think uh, Kimmy Cole can show some slides that that I sent her about some community archaeology projects that have been done at Manzanar, and I I would recommend a community archaeology project here, uh, maybe run, run by the folks from the State Historic Preservation Office or the National Park Service who have already offered to help. The, um, you can get, am I too, am I too loud to, okay, louder? I should be, okay. I'll be louder, I'm sorry for mumbling. Um, Kamiko, could you show some of those? I found them here, but I can't get them up there. Oh, okay. But I'm, I'm scrolling through them as we're talking here. Oh, okay, so just imagine <laughs> <laughs> if, this were, if this were Topaz, we would set up a grid, we'd make squares. Oh, they're so pretty, I'm sorry you can't see them because they might have red flags at each corner and string and and everything is all measured out in precision ways so that um, you can map everything, you can photograph everything, you can um, record what what is there. And it, it, uh, it may seem insignificant like a beer bottle somebody threw from the, you know, the road or something, but it, it also could include something cool like maybe a, uh, glass bottle from the 1940s that somebody had put a flower vase there. Uh, so, you know, it's definitely worth looking at everything. Um, I would do it with the Japanese American community involved in designing the whole project from start to finish because it 
as archaeologists are slowly learning, that's the way to go. I mean, we archaeologists used to just run in, grab the artifact, and put it in a museum because that's what was considered a good thing. So uh, it, it's evolving. And thanks to you all. Am I doing? Uh, what? Am I? Should I go over here? Closer, closer, like this. Oh my gosh. Um, okay. Um, what was I saying? Um, oh, pe yeah, people. The uh, it's not not I don't not just Japanese American community and Topaz descendants, but the Delta folks too. I think you could have a really meaningful interaction over archaeology because you are together. You're working. It's hot or cold, sweaty, windy. It's uh, experiencing the site in ways that those incarcerated there experienced it. it it's miserable, but you'll love it um, <laughs> because you might find a nail or something. Now, first you do the surface, very detailed surface thing, and then you would maybe divide it further and start excavating in you know, controlled levels, like, it's, all, it's like a, it's like a cake you're eating wrong, I guess. You're just doing slices, slices, slices. And er everything you, you do from your square, your unit, we call them units, is sifted through a one quarter inch or one eighth inch screen so that you'll find anything that's in there. And that way you might find a, you, it, you know, what if somebody threw in a memento or something when they when they buried the rock? What if they threw in, or maybe something accidentally fell in, a button or a coin or something? So that would be so sweet to see. Um, and you would do that until you got to the bottom of where you think the rock originally was, which would, so it'd have to be as big, your square hole. It would look, does anyone remember telephone booths? You're too young. Um, and anyway, that's that's one way of digging archaeological units. You just go straight down in these layers and screening everything and recording everything, drawing everything. And you would maybe be able to tell how big the original hole was that the Issei dug in order to bury the stone this could be a really good place to do archaeology because it's a lake bed. And so the lake lays down sediments as it dries out. And you might, you know, in your beautiful telephone booth, you you're, you have sidewalls that could show those layers. But they would be disturbed. They would be, there would be remnants of the pattern of the hole um, where the Issei originally dug, dug the uh, in order to bury the, the the stone, so stuff like that. But I think working together, it's it gives people. A, I've noticed at Manzanar, people talk ab about well, civil rights, rights in ways that you you might be embarrassed if you just met someone and sat in a circle. But if you're working with them for a few days, you really you really uh, feel open to sharing ideas about. I mean, it's it softens it. I think. I mean, it's hard to talk about racisms and terrible things that the government does. But if you're in a project like that, you're 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 doing something to mark it, to memorialize it. So, does that answer your question? Yes, except I still have a question on how would the site be secured. Like, like the weather, the weather is very harsh in that desert. It from dry heat to snowing and rain and flood. So how how does how do you secure a situation like a site in a situation like that? Also, how would you have prepared the monument for it, removal? Uh, archaeologically, you wouldn't do it with a forklift. You, 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 you would have done the the grid thing, and you would have 
excavated very slowly. And I, um, our, I should admit, archaeologists have learned this through a century of trying to, you know, refine the the craft or science we like to call it. Um, what can give you the most information? And so. Archaeologists used to maybe, if they had forklifts in those days, they probably would have done that. But um, are you sure you want me to talk about this? We, um, it, it would have been a lot slower, and and we would have sifted everything, and we would have documented everything and taken a, a lot of pictures. And I, since there's some people that know how to do videos, that would be cool too. Videographers there. There exists video of the excavation. We would like. There's. We have a petition to release the video. Uh, I. I imagine that not being able to see the videos is a little bit like the topaz incarceries not hearing the full story of what happened to Mr. Wakasa. It's not that. It's not that you suspect that that was done disrespectfully or people were smoking cigarettes and making jokes or anything it's just that it's it's part of what you need it's part of what the topaz people weren't given the the incarcerees weren't given that transparency so it must it must hurt not to be able to see that um but i I think uh, you didn't you didn't video the uh, park service people because maybe because archaeologists are kind of shy. Um, okay, well, I I think your your filmmakers could come to the community archaeology project and interview people, and I think uh, I've heard some really cool ideas from Masako and Nancy and Patrick and others about how it could be a, a healing thing. It could be coming together and know it. It, it, uh, it there still could be valuable information there, but maybe the most valuable part of it is being together to repair that land, to repair that landscape. Um, maybe that's what you could work toward. Um, I have to, so Mary, I just wanted you to describe um, what you did over the Labor Day weekend, and I want to know what the temperature was. I was a volunteer at an archaeological, no, it wasn't archaeology. It was actually a restoration project. So volunteers can do many different things. And this at the children's village was the only orphanage among the 10 concentrations. So it's a hugely poignant thing to think of 101 children being uh, locked up. Some of them had already been adopted out to Caucasian families and they were brought back in. And um, in a few years before the pandemic, we, Jeff, started doing community archaeology projects at the Children's Village um, at the request of one of the former orphans who thought it would it was time to tell that story with some physical things because it's it's so powerful to be in the place where something happened. And so for a few years, his projects exposed the foundations. You don't have to go very deep in these sites that are only 80 years old or 70 years old. He exposed the foundations of the buildings where the children had lived and the, and the caretakers had lived. He found, with volunteers, the post holes where they had built a fence 
you you can tell a post hole the same way. It's soft. It'll be even though it's refilled with dirt, it'll be soft. And you can you can so if you scrape it, you can see the outline. Um, they found like walkways. They found what do you call the thing you pound? You make mochi in. Yeah, they found one of those. It it there. Um, we found a little toy truck, marbles, uh, some doll parts of a doll, baby bottle, um, baby crib piece. So these were all things that he found in previous years, just trying to establish a sense of place. Before it was just total overgrown bramble bushes and you couldn't see anything. So, so he did that. And then this weekend, using the data that he had found where posts were, we, we got to rebuild some landscape fences. Well, probably to keep the little ones from wandering out too, but they were, I, um, I wish you could see the pictures. They're really nice. The original ones that the, that the uh, incarceries built for the orphans were just beautiful rustic branches, you know, like wired together and tied together. And so we were trying to recreate that the best we could. And it was so rewarding. And it was 104 or 105. But um, there was some shade and you just work slow and drink a lot of water. I can probably. I can. I can. Can you remind me? Okay. Before we pass the mic. Uh, you know, just four quick things. Uh, number one, just hearing all these stories about topaz, I couldn't help but rem just remember that I was probably. How many people here can say they climbed up? one of those guard towers and swore at the MPs at the other end, you know? Two times I did that with Arthur and Bobby and I just brought back this memory, you know? And we climbed up the, uh, the guard tower, the one between the, the, the southwest corner and the northwest corner, the one in between. And Arthur said, Toto, pick up that phone and swear at the MPs, you know? So I just knew shit and son of a bitch then, you know, learn motherfucker after I left camp, you know, but, but at the time, so we, I swear at the MP that we see this Jeep coming in that cloud of dust, you know, half a mile away. So we scampered down and we ran like hell twice. And the other thing is I just realized how much of an archeologist I am because in 1995, I was standing in front of our block four, barrack 10, C and D, and I dug a hole in the front of my front porch, which is still there, and I found 26 marbles that I hid, in, that I, I hid under the porch as a kid, right? So, God, here I am, an archaeologist, and didn't even realize it. Number three thing, you know, and I was like, um, Patrick, I was so upset and insulted that, that they would dig up the Wakasa stone and trash it and you know, denigrated, et cetera. But, you know, I was thinking in retrospect, you know, it's, it's, it's almost fitting that, you know, the, 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 the damage they did to the stone, and I hope there are some, def, you know, from permanent scars, because it would just be a, 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 a reminder of how uh, resilient we are. You know, we went there, I was there, my mother, of course, are all dead now, but we lived through it, and I'm sure that stone could survive the beatings and the damage that, the, you know, that was done to it. And it's almost symbolic, because we were put into those camps, you know, illegally, et cetera, uh, and so was Bacasa. Now his stone is getting the same treatment we got, only this was about a year ago, right? And so we're here fighting and talking about how indignant these people were to treat one of ours, you know, with... Uh, uh, like a trash, you know, piece of trash. And uh, of course, I'm indignant about the, uh, the insensitivity of treating one of us 
with that with such disregard. But at the same time, I realized we're we're resilient. You know, we're going to live through this. We're going to go past this. And whatever happens to the rock is irrelevant to me. You know, whether they, I'd like to think that Brock would come home to San Francisco where we all started. Right? He was lived on Taylor. We lived on Taylor Street. We lived in Block Thirty Six. He lived in Thirty Six. So. You know, if if we can bring him back that stone back as a symbol of his life and what he stood for, we can um, go and put our flowers there and pay our respect to him. Uh, in, in some ways, we'd be paying respect to our parents and our grandparents and our people who have who have died and gone ahead too. So it's it's a symbol of our survival uh, 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 skills and. Uh, when I really think about it, you know, this is almost a blessing that if, you know, they'd have taken care of the stone with respect, et cetera, it wouldn't be fitting because the way we treated us when we were evicted out of our homes and sent there, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's a blessing that what happened happened. But I think from here forward, we've got to take control over our own destiny, uh, over our own uh, 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 our our past and whatever we stand for today. And so um, uh, I'm really happy and I, I, I don't, I really don't care what, what they do with the stone. I'd say we should be, it should be brought back to the Peace Plaza in San Francisco, but whatever, whatever they do is fine with me because, you know, it's brought, like Masako said, it's brought us together. Uh, we're able to say our peace and uh, 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 if anything, it kind of united us together, you know, and that's a good thing. Yeah. You and Brandon have to have a conversation. Um, so I'll just speak really loud. Uh, I'm just going to read a couple of audience uh, questions. This one is a two-parter. Well, actually, it's multiple parts. Um, who owns the land where the monument was eventually found? Is it federal land? state land, or is it privately held land? And then the follow-up question, if the land is owned by the federal or state government, would the provenance of the monument be to one of those entities? Um, does somebody want to answer that question? Okay, well, I'll answer that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it is privately owned by uh, the nonprofit entity that is the Topaz Museum Board. Um, so that's the answer to that question. It's by the uh, <clears throat> follow up question here from a different party. Uh, and can a private group own a site where a national crime was committed? Federal government claim it under eminent domain as belonging to the nation. I have no idea the answer to that question. Does anybody know? Okay, so next question. Uh, I would love to hear of any updates or developments since the last meeting with the Topaz Community Outreach Project. Okay, Anne, Dion. Oh, I have, I have a message. Is it appropriate for me? Sure. To... Why don't you uh, okay. come up here and, and yeah. with the microphone? All right. <clears throat> She don't hear. She was there with because we won't get back to her. She won't get any feedback. This is feedback. By the way, I, I would like to say that I was very pleased to be here because in the uh, frame, that photo uh, in that uh, Kimi Kamar prepared, uh, she showed the uh, Topaz Hospital, and uh, the nurse was my aunt. <laughs> so that course was very personal, thrilling. Uh, my name is Ann Tamaki Dion, and I've been working with the Friends of Topaz since 2013. And uh, we currently have uh, exhibit the Topaz stories in the Utah State Capitol, and it's going to be up there for a year uh, till the end, starting from this January to December, so we're very thrilled about that. And we continue to collect, uh, the collection is also available online, topazstories.com. But in the state exhibit, we had uh, 
over 30 stories. The collection is now over 70 stories, and we continue to collect stories uh, from either um, the person that was in camp, or in many cases because of the age, from their descendants. So, you know, if you have a story, we'd love to hear it. <laughs> um, this is a statement from the Topaz Museum Board, and I hope it will shed some light on um, what is happening going forward. Members of the Topaz Board wanted to be here tonight in person, but scheduling and travel conflicts prevented that from happening. So instead, they have asked us, members of the Friends of Topaz Museum, to convey some information that we think will move the conversation forward. We want to emphasize that we're not here to answer any questions. We just want to convey important information and make some announcements. Number one, the Topaz Board has authorized a resolution that invites members of the Wakasa Memorial Committee to join them in planning the memorial event to be held in April 2023, commemorating the 80th anniversary of Mr. Wakasa's killing and the protests held by fellow inmates who built his memorial. The Topaz Museum Board would like to work with the Wakasa Memorial Committee and other stakeholders to make this happen in a way that honors Mr. Wakasa's memory and emphasizes the importance of educating people about his unjust killing and the incarceration of other Japanese Americans at Topaz. Two, the second announcement we'd like to make is that archeologist Chris Merritt from the Utah State Historic Preservation Office has made a proposal to work with the Topaz Museum Board and the Wakasa Memorial Committee to conserve and preserve the monument and the site. Details are being worked out and a press release is being created as we speak, but we wanted to make this announcement tonight. Three, the third announcement is that a restructuring of the Topaz Museum Board is underway. The new interim co-presidents of the board are Patricia Wakita and Scott Bassett, who will primarily focus on external affairs. Jane Beckwith will continue to be in charge of day-to-day -day operations and increasing her ability to engage directly with the many visitors and groups who have averaged 10,000 visits a year. Finally, the Topaz Museum Board thanks everyone who participated in the three month long Topaz Community Outreach Project and are grateful for those who filled out the survey, attended the meetings and sent in questions. The outreach project ended on August 30th. Over 350 people responded to the survey and approximately 150 people attended the public meetings to share their ideas and feelings about the future of the Wakasa Monument and to give input on the Wakasa 80th anniversary commemorative ceremony. The board feels that the opinions and suggestions from the wider stakeholder community are valuable, so we will be sharing that feedback to the Wakasa Monument Committee to consider for implementation should they accept the invitation to collaborate with us on planning this event. They are in the process of reviewing the most frequently asked questions that came out of the survey and meetings and are now working on addressing them. These frequently asked questions 
and responses will be published on the Topaz Community Outreach website soon. We are grateful for your patience and support. In addition, a full report of the data and comments collected during the outreach effort will be sent to the board in October and shared with the public once they have reviewed it. Thank you. Uh, some comments. Okay. Um, Kimiko, do you have the slide? I just wanted to. I don't have it up there, but I have it here. Oh, okay. Um, so people in this room cannot see it. Is that right? No. Okay. Can we do that? Um, first of all, the invitation to participate in an 80th century. Eight, eight, excuse me, 80th anniversary ceremony in 2023, which you say that the board has extended to us, is actually one of the six points that the Wakasa committee um, extended, wrote about to the Topaz Museum Board one year and two days ago. And um, it was, as we can see on this slide, I hope, Okay, so on September 7th, 2021, the Wakasa Committee had just formed and we wrote a letter to the Topaz Museum Board and we had six points. The purpose was to move forward, to come together, to collaborate, discuss how to treat our cultural heritage and the pain that had resulted from the way that it was removed without informing us. And so you'll notice that number five was memorial ceremony at the Topaz site our request was that the Topaz Museum and Wakasa Memorial Committee work collaboratively to plan a community-involved memorial ceremony for April 11th, 2023, the 80th anniversary of the Wakasa homicide and the construction of the Wakasa monument and its forced erasure. And um, Dr. Duncan Williams, who you may know as a religious studies professor at USC, is on our advisory council, and he recommended this particular year and time because he thought it gave us enough lead time to plan and the 80th anniversary was um, a decade mark and important. And so we extended that invitation a year ago. We're, very, we're pleased that the museum board has agreed um, to work together. But I must say that we did not dream that the monument would still be sitting on the construction pallet 13 months later and that the memorial site would still be vulnerable, um, untreated, with no plan um, that we are aware of, and certainly no stakeholder involvement, including members of our committee. So we feel that the urgent need is for um, treating, discussing, and um, having a remedy for the immediate stabilization of the stone and the site. And we really can't plan um, for a ceremony when more urgent existential questions the release of the video, which is still not um, been, ha has not happened. Partnership and consultation, which addresses your point that you say was conveyed by the board, that we work together um, and have meetings that are be sponsored and convened by the Utah um, State Historic Office. That actually invitation was made by the Utah Office to all of us, that is the Topaz Board and the Wakasa Committee and the National Park Service in May, four months ago. They made that invitation at the Wakasa Memorial Committee's invitation. State Historic Office, will you please help us get together because time is going by and we need to sit down at the table together as full partners. And on May 13th, Chris Merritt, the archeologist said, I think that's a really good idea. My office is willing to convene it. Um, according to that office, when we asked, well, what happened to the idea of doing this? He said the Topaz Museum Board wrote and said, we're not interested because we're going to run these Topaz Community Outreach Project meetings, which as you know, just ended August 30th. Now, the problem with those meetings is that the content of those meetings is going to lead directly to what they call executable guidelines for a plan for the tr to treat the monument and the site. And we find that completely inadequate. And I must say the, the survey 
and the community meetings were created by the entity that perpetrated the damage which gave rise to the need for meetings. The meetings had no um, involvement by stakeholders in forming the questions for the survey. There was zero opportunity for people to um, speak at these meetings and have input. It was structured so that a PowerPoint was shown and then everyone was sent to stations, as, as you know, um, to write your ideas on post-its. And in the two virtual meetings, we were very disappointed, shocked, and frankly, it's not happy that people were muted, um, survivors and descendants, and my friend who's a curation um, expert from the African American Museum Association were muted by graduate students um, who were helping the um, leader of, this, of these meetings um, limit our comments. And so I, I, I must say that we are trying to be good partners, be in good faith, we are working on a press release. The results, um, we still are, um, need to iron those out. So I wish that one of the two board members could have been here to talk to us instead of sending um, a Friends of Topaz person because a board member didn't appear at any of the six meetings. There were lots of questions that we wanted to act directly, but um, there was no communication. And we really feel that the board needs to be accountable. And Chizu, would you like to say something and come up here? Because you went to all six meetings, and so did you, Masako. And, and it's just very concerning. This, this, search, this search for how to proceed, whether how to do the next step in terms of taking care of the stone and taking care of the, uh, taking care of the site itself has actually been done already by the Park Service and they did a damage assessment report that came out last December, November, the end of November and the beginning of December, and did a thorough assessment of the site at Topaz, where the stone was removed, and then they had a rock expert, maybe there were two, there were two women pouring over the stone from their office also. And there, there was a very lengthy damage assessment report released in January of this year, which delineated the damage done at the site, the damage done to the stone, and itemized how to take care of the stone next, how to store it properly, because it is currently collapsing of its own weight and molding in the way that it's being stored now by the museum. So I personally feel urgent. It's our stone. This is our history. I'm very urgently wanting to preserve and conserve the stone itself and the site. I, and I haven't met anybody who doesn't want that. And the the instructions on how to do so and the offers to help from the National Park Service has not been accepted by the museum. Now, you may not know all these details, but as you can see, we've been asking for these things for almost a year now, more than a year. More than a year. So, you know, I was just there a couple of weeks ago. Chizu and I have gone to every single of your meetings and also the in-person meetings and Zoom. And we have found that at each one of those, it was very difficult to actually voice an opinion. I'm sorry to say, I've met you at one and you might remember that yourself. So anyway, Jason. Yes, uh, I decided that I would go to all of the meetings because I really needed to see what the Topaz board meant by community input, uh, their project of community input. Well, you know, we weren't born yesterday. I mean, I'm 92 years old and I've been to lots of meetings and lots of virtual everythings and I have never seen a so-called community input meetings, the, the series, conducted in a way that almost prohibited community input. That's just the way it turned out. And seeing how we do have Topaz board members who live in the Bay Area, I was very disappointed to see that they didn't show up at the first two meetings. And then when we went to Delta, which is where the museum exists and where seven of the board members live close to the museum, 
none of them showed up at the meeting. Who were there? Docents. Well, it was very nice to meet the docents. They're lovely people, and they're very conscientious, and we got quite friendly, and, um, you know, I didn't feel that we could ask their, them questions because they were in no position to answer the kinds of information that we were seeking. And I had made a bet with my sister that, well, they have to show up in Delta. After all, that's where they are. And so now I owe her an expensive dinner because not one showed up at any of the meetings. I mean, that, that's an insult to the community. What is the problem? You know, I, I'm really angry that we're not, that we didn't have any face-to-face -face discussions. Um, anyway, those are my feelings. And to say that, <sighs> well, you get the idea. <laughs> anyway, um, at Delta, where the museum is, we had a total of five of us from the Bay Area here, and um, I think there were 10 or 11 people, most of whom were docents, and maybe there was one or uh, one other person who was like a community member. So in Delta, we had like 16 people show up for their meeting. So what kind of a community input meeting was that? Anyway, I, I was just terribly disappointed. Sorry. Oh, uh, no, we're just getting close to the to the time where uh, we need to, to end the live stream. Um, we can still chat here amongst us uh, here in person, but Masako would like to say something here towards the end. Well, I want to remind everybody what a joy it was to find out that there was a reason for the incredible tension that I felt all the years of my life, <laughs> just living my life. And the fact that my family and all the other people at Topaz and at every other concentration camp lived under the constant 24-7 threat of being killed for no reason. So all those bat baseball games you've seen in the arts and crafts classes and the dances and the movies, all of that was being done, if you pull back the camera, under the gaze of armed guards aiming rifles at them. So the stone represents all those unspoken things that our parents shielded us from. And so I think that that has a lot to do with the pain because we're feeling their pain too. They never told us the awful stories because they wanted us to be happy. And I think that we owe it to them to honor them and our history and to thank Nancy for finding the map and publishing it along with the story in a place that Mary and Jeff actually read it and that they found it in their hearts to get in their car and drive from Southern California to in the middle of nowhere, Utah, and take a look for it and found it. So I have the great joy and pleasure of uh, <laughs> giving them in for the Takahashi Family Foundation, my parents, Henry and Tomoe, would be so proud to be here. But anyway. Nancy, <laughs> thank you for your, the excellence of your achievement for what everything that you've done. And to Mary, <laughs> thank you. You've changed my life. Oh, <laughs> Mary, come back. Oh, no. <laughs> Patrick Hayashi. Oh, um, when, when Mr. Wakasa was killed, um, Kiyoshi. Kats Katsumoto reported 
seen a fireball or in Japanese, a hinotama uh, that represented, that contained Mr. Wakasa's spirit in the sky. And they, did you really? Wow. And so, and so um, Nancy asked me to paint Mr. Wakasa's spirit. And I, this is what I came up with. Thank you, Patrick. Can you describe the Hino Thomas? Well, I tell you the truth. Um, and I thought many times, was I hallucinating? Was I dreaming? But I remember seeing as a kid this um, a light that looked like a fan with many blades that came out and it hovered over the, the barracks uh, at night. And uh, I kept thinking many times, was that a dream or was that reality? It was reality as far as I'm concerned, but it's something that I've never spoken about because I thought people think I'm cuckoo or something. <laughs> but anyway, I did see it and I have to say, you know, in all honesty, it was there. I was there. Yeah. Okay, so for our live stream audience, thank you so much for sticking with us for two hours, your troopers. Um, and as I put in the chat, we will continue to answer any questions that you have. So go to the link that I put in the chat. We will answer them on the Wakasa Memorial website. We'll put the questions and the answers. Um, so thank you very much. And we're going to say good night from, uh, from here at JCCCNC. Thanks, everybody. Thank